Good evening, everyone. As Michelle mentioned, my name is Sally Kay, and I'm the head of our uh, public policy and external affairs for Amazon based here in San Francisco. We're so pleased to be the sponsor of tonight's program, which focuses on the inspirational story of my dear friend and colleague, David Ambrose. David's story captured in his memoir, A Place Called Home, is powerful, inspirational, and it provides a gorgeously written and emotionally rich telling of the reality of what youth like David have experienced and can face in foster care and homelessness. I have the pleasure of knowing this man well and his beautiful heart for others, his tireless advocacy, and his optimism for the future of what we can build together. I already knew how incredible he was when I read this book, and you're such a lucky group here tonight because reading A Place Called Home, along with getting to know David, is that much more meaningful. The book is being sold outside, and I encourage you to pick up a copy before you leave if you haven't already. It's not just a great story. It's a call to action and advocacy for all of us to advocate for the many thousands of youths nationwide and here in the Bay Area who are going through the type of experiences in David's book. And that's why tonight, I'm pleased to announce that in honor of Foster Care Awareness Month, Amazon will honor one of our local organizations doing incredible work here in San Francisco, Larkin Street Youth Services, with a grant of $25,000. <laughs> Larkin Street is said to set the standard in approaching the complexities of youth experiencing homelessness through housing, healthcare, employment, and more. And Amazon is so proud to recognize and celebrate them tonight. I believe Gail Roberts from... And Sherilyn's here. Oh, great. <laughs> so I wanted to stand and recognize them. Thank you for all your work. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Sherilyn Adams and Gail Roberts. Now, let's get on to our program. I'm pleased that speaking with David tonight will be Amy Lemley. Amy is the executive director of John Burton Advocates for Youth, or JBay, and an advocate for foster and homeless youth. In her role at JBay, Amy leads the organization's policy advocacy, which has resulted in the passage of key reforms, including extending foster care age to age 21, increasing financial aid for foster youth, and improved access to affordable housing. Prior to Burton Advocates, Amy co-founded and served as the executive director of First Place for Youth, a nationally recognized nonprofit providing affordable housing and supportive services to current and former foster youth. She is a true leader in this field. And with that, I'm so pleased to bring Amy and my dear friend and colleague, David Ambrose, to the stage for tonight's program. Amazon is very happy you're here tonight, and I hope you will, all, you will join us for the reception after the program. Thank you. Yeah. Hello. Hi, David. Hey. Well, thank you very much, Sally, uh, for that introduction. And thank you, Amazon, for your generous support of tonight's event. Um, and thank you for Michelle. Um, we're really excited uh, to be here tonight to talk about David's book. I'm still doing, you need to figure out my glasses here. Um, as, as you heard, my name's Amy Lemley. I'm with John Burton Advocates for Youth. I'm the executive director there. And our organization is working to improve the lives of young people in foster care who have been in foster care or homeless. And we do that by advocating for better laws, uh, training counties to implement those laws, and then really conducting research to inform policy and practice. And I'm very pleased to tonight to be the moderator of our conversation uh, with the inspiring and motivating David Ambrose, whose memoir, A Place Called Home, describes his story about the experiences in foster care and homelessness and how he became the man he is today. I know after this talk, you'll want to purchase the book right outside this room, and there are many copies out there. So Dory, uh, David's story of struggle is familiar to me because it is a story of thousands of youth uh, that organizations like mine and many others assist. Uh, David's story is ultimately one of promise and inspiration, and I really look forward to our conversation tonight. But before we jump into our conversation, I want to quickly remind you that we would like your audience questions. So if you have a question for David or for me, and you're here in the audience, please take a moment to fill out the question cards on your seats. And if you are watching online, uh, please put them into the YouTube chat feature and questions will be forwarded to me uh, throughout the program. And I hope to get as many of them as possible. Okay, so let's jump in and turn it over to David, who will, I think, begin the evening by reading the first chapter of his book. Oh, my goodness. Thank you. 
Hi, everybody. Uh, how many of you read the book? I'm not judging you. <laughs> wow, some people that didn't raise their hand, it's very surprising. And candidly, a little disappointing. Just kidding. Uh, so, A Place Called Home. And I'm going to actually read something that most people skip over, which is the dedication I made the book out, which is to my mother, who taught me to forgive and conquer one impossible thing at a time. And then a phrase that most people skip over as well, and if there's a question about it, I'm glad to answer it, illegitimi non coverundum. Maybe there's a question about that. Fill out your form. <laughs> Chapter one. I'm hungry. I've waited as long as I can, and I now scoot past my siblings to tug on my mother's jacket. She swats me away. Walk straight, mom commands. Her voice deep and robotic, the voice of a stranger. If we stop walking, we will freeze to death. It's Christmas in Manhattan, and the Midtown department store's windows glow, each one a framed fantasy. My neck swivels as I pass, entranced by the rich golds, reds, and greens. My eyes fix on a display with an electric train chugging in a circle around a tree. It weaves through snowy heaps of presents, some wrapped, some with pictures on toys on the outside. I'm only five, and all I know about Christmas is the stories I've heard at the churches where we go for free meals, and that in December, music drifts from the doorway of every store, and windows fill with magic. I want more than anything to get my hand on that train. A man crosses between me and my brother, bags brimming with gifts hanging from both arms. His pale face flushed with cold. He steps into the street and hails a taxi. I watch for a moment as he gets in, feeling a longing I don't understand. I want to be part of his life, to be his child, to be him, to be so blissfully unaware of the luxury of a warm taxi. I pull my eyes away, returning them to the backs of my siblings and my mother. From behind, my mom's jacket looks like a puffy sleeping bag with arms. The three of us follow her like ducklings, eyes locked onto that jacket. Jessica, the oldest, is right behind mom. She's seven and holds my hands when the streets aren't so crowded. Alex, he's right behind her. He's one year older than me, and he's constantly in motion, balancing on curbs and jumping up against walls when it's not so cold. Then there's me. Tourists shove in all directions, still warm from wherever they got their last hot chocolates. I dodge past them expertly, never pausing. No matter how alluring that window is, the most important thing is to never lose my family. On the fringes of this shiny holiday wonderland, in the dark alcoves and corners of the night, are people like us, passing like ghosts around and through the bright, clean tourists. We drift in circles, making our home everywhere and nowhere. We hunker down in the colorless crevices of the city, in the gray shadows of gray buildings where the gray snow is piled. We are a gray people fading to nothing. We head further uptown, and as Times Square bleeds into the Upper West Side, neighborhoods shift in character. I know this area by the sidewalks. My favorite are up in Harlem. They're embedded with mica. The sun sets over the apartment buildings, and darkness begins to truly spread over Manhattan. Night is the worst time to be outside without a home. My mother continues to stare straight ahead into the eve of the night, lost in her own thoughts. It's cold. It's getting colder. And we have no destination. Mom, I try to get her attention. But it's futile when she's in this state. She flatly repeats her refrain, walk straight. Hours pass this way, and the temperature drops. Every puddle has a skin of ice. The snow heaped on either side of the sidewalk is frozen solid. The city is frozen solid. My feet are stubs. I stare down at them to make sure they're still there. My dirty sneakers, plucked from the trash, are clownishly large. The laces wrapped once around the sole and then tied on a bow on top to keep them on. Every time I take a step, my foot floats up within the shoe and then reconnects with the sole when I hit the pavement. I count as high as I can to pass time, but I lose track. My mind is foggy, so I switch to songs. 
We heard a story last night at the church about three kings bringing gifts to the baby Jesus. Gold, frankincense, and myrrh. What is myrrh? They walked all night too following a star. We need a star. Instead, instead, our homelessness stretches on forever in all directions, studded with temporary refuges, a bus shelter, a subway car, a shelter, the hospital waiting room, a Bowery slum. I'm angling for any of these now. Mom, over there. I spotted a subway vent and can see steam rising from the familiar metal grid. It's unclear whether she hears me. Regardless, she does not answer. Her eyes dart left and right behind her fogged, red-framed drugstore glasses. She's checking to see if anyone's following us. This time, in spite of her suspicion, she allows us to stop. Warm air seeps out and up. My exposed hands feel it first, then my body, and finally my toes prick back to life. I hear the rumble before I feel it and sneak a glance at Alex. We make eye contact, and the corner of his mouth turns up. He hears it too. The rumble surges to a roar, and a subway car shoots below us through the station. A welcome blast of damp, warm air envelops us. I could stay here all night, but the respite is tantalizingly short. A gray figure emerges from the steam. Good evening, he says, politely enough, but mom hears danger. Get over here. Enough, let's go, mom says. To where, I wonder. We end up right back where we started, walking. Mom must be getting cold. Does she even feel the cold? I can't be sure. I look at my brother and sister. Jessica's steps drag now. Alex, the troublemaker, is completely silent. My siblings have not spoken for hours. There is no joking around. There's no whining. There's no pestering. There is survival. We know to be quiet when mom's in this mood, but I have to try something. I take a deep breath and try again. Mom, we're close to the Port Authority. Can we go inside? Walk straight. They're after us. Mom is always worried about people coming to get us, but they never come. And the three of us already understand that although there are real dangers, they are only in her mind. There is a calculation I make when I talk to my mom. Will she hit me, and is it worth it? Asking for a candy bar is not worth it. But when she's challenging an authority or beating up on one of us too much, I take the risk. I need to keep us going. I try again. Mom, we have to go inside. In my head, I'm saying so much more. I'm saying all of it. We're too cold. I love my sister. You're killing us. Wake up. I want to slap her with these words. I can't feel my feet. I can barely breathe. Mom, I'm not shivering anymore. Mom, we're dying. Mom stops and looks at me for the first time in hours, actually looks. She's going to hit me. Is she going to hit me? I can usually tell, but not right now. We wait in front of her. We can't navigate this world on our own, not yet. Okay, okay, Mama Lenz. Victory. We're going inside, somewhere, somehow. We march past fast food restaurants, closed, hair salons, metal roll down doors. She must have a destination in mind now. Does she have a destination in mind? Her mind is a riddle, unsolvable. We find ourselves outside of a box of a building with painted metal roll down doors, slightly opened. It's hunkered down, this building, like it's avoiding eye contact. Mom rings the doorbell and then bangs and bangs. Finally, the door opens. Lady, this is a men's shelter, the man at the threshold announces, blocking our way. What the hell is wrong with you, Mom roars. Excuse me? Don't talk to me like that. She says something about clouds from a bombing in Northern Ireland and nuclear waste. It's all around us out here. You're exposing us to it. The man looks startled and is speechless. They are at an impasse. I feel a surprising warmth move down my legs. Then the warmth quickly cools, 
and the smell of urine rises up to my nose. I hadn't realized that I had to pee or that it was happening. I peed my pants, I announced loudly to no one in particular. The man looks at me now for the first time. His dreads are pulled back neatly, his eyes bright. Like the man I saw getting into the taxi, I want this man too. I want him to protect me. I want to be a person like him who controls and owns the warmth and decides who lives and gets to come in from the cold. His glance flits from me to Alex to Jessica. And then he says, after a pause, fine, come in, but you can't let the kids out of your sight. These guys in here are f***ed up. He ushers us into a warehouse-like space, and I see what he means. Some shelters are bright and clean with spaces for children. This room is not. It is dark and cavernous. Ahead, I see only the outlines of coffins, rows and rows of them. On top of each lie a single body. Are they dead? I ask. Nearly, he says. He points to a single empty cot. There. That's it? Mom asks. What the f*** do you want? This isn't a hotel. He snaps. Okay, Mom says. Like I said, don't let them out of your sight. He turns and walks away. Sit, Mom tells us. My eyes adjust the dark and the details of our not dead neighbors emerge. They are surrounded by bags of all sizes, belching their contents out onto the floor. Sometimes we have bags too, but not tonight. We are wearing everything we own. I smell my own urine, but now it's dominated by the st stench of funk, sweat, and vomit that brews in this overheated space. My mother stands above us, and as my eyes get used to the dark, I see something in her face shift. Another mom is now emerging, the one who knows what to do. This mom hugs us as often and as easily as this other mom hits us. Is this what you want? Mom asks, gesturing to the room of lost souls. The drunk, the miserable specters of their imminent deaths, Mom doesn't talk about the future. Poverty is never about the future. It's obsessed with the now, as it must be if you are to survive. No, I cry out. This is not what I want. I catch only glimpses of other lives, spotting them like speeding on an express train. But I am certain I don't want this. I don't want to see Jessica fall again. I don't like it when Alex is quiet. I don't want to be here, surrounded by the nameless, homeless masses, sitting in my own urine. My brother and sister lean into me from either side as I cry, wanting to comfort me, but none of us quite able. I don't know what I'll have to do to escape this life. It's all I've ever known. But somewhere in the darkness, my mother has unleashed a spark of hope. She is asking me what I want. She's asking me to believe in something other than this, something better. I'm five, but I already know this. I want a roof. I want a roof to sleep under for more than a night. I want it to have furniture and toys. I want to protect my older siblings. I want to protect us from mom, and I want to protect mom from mom. I want to be the man in the shelter with a warm space he decides how to share. I want to be another man, one I have not met yet. I have no idea what life would be like. I have no idea what life could be like. But for the first time, I know what I want, not this. Okay, good, mom says. She doesn't want this for us either, the chaos inside of her that spills out to engulf us. She sits down next to us on the single cot. We lie back horizontal across the cot, our feet dangling off the side, squeezed between my siblings and a woman who for a brief moment has come as close as she ever gets to being a real mom. I curl into this dog pile of my family and sleep. Chapter one.
Thank you, David, so much for starting uh, there. And I want to start with something you told me as we walked in, and you uh, also referenced it uh, in the chapter, is more than even about a book about foster care or homelessness. This is about poverty. So can you tell me more what you mean by that? And yeah. Yeah, I think most of us in society in general focus on the very tips of the tree branch, which are the symptoms, homelessness, um, uh, people in jail, all of these things. But if you follow the branch back to the trunk and the trunk down to the root and the root and the soil, it is poverty. It is poverty that has all these pernicious externalities that we are all living through. Uh, poverty is not just wealth, it's hope and aspiration and safety. I grew up in communities that were rich in violence, mm -hmm. rich in inherited poverty, over-policed, hyper-vigilized with crappy housing. And, and yet we are shocked collectively as a society when the kids that grow up in that space, when the kids that grow up in schools that are not safe, come out the other end and perpetuate those cycles. And then we deal with the symptoms. We put them in jail. We house them in there as a young mother with kids. We deal with the mental health and the violence that, that arises. We try and retrain them for the workforce. So if we want to address the issues that I write about, we really need to look at poverty. Not since 1999 in a presidential debate have the words child poverty been mentioned. We've talked about coal miners in every single debate. There are 18,000 coal miners. There are 8.4 million American children today living in abject poverty. Google it, and you know what image comes up? Robert Kennedy, because that's the last time it was a presidential <laughs> issue. So we need to center 8.4 billion American children in our hearts, in our politics, not to fix schools, not to address this. Go back to why there are 8.4 million. What are the structures we have that are leading to that? And that's how we're gonna actually address everything. And I don't mean that we shouldn't help people, but if we truly wanna be change agents, we have to do both. We have to fix what's going on at the root of these issues. Mm -hmm. To kind of apply that to your experience, do you feel that is where the challenge started with your family? Mm. Like uh, that fundamentally there weren't the resources there for your family to get the help that it needed? So a couple thoughts. Your safety word's purple if I talk too long. <laughs> so I think there's a number of issues. So number one, I've always thought about the poverty programs that we had access to as, as a lifeboat. So my family is over here drowning and the lifeboat rolls up and I'm like, sweet Jesus. They pull you out of the water and you go, <gasps> and you breathe. And then they drop you back in the water. And then they say, don't worry, there's a person right behind me. And sure enough, there's a person, it's another program. And it pulls you out of the water. No one pulls you all out of the water. Program by program, you're whittled away. My mom, in order to get access to housing assistance, needed to have an address. We were homeless. We had to go to a different office for food stamps. Our schools were falling apart when we went to them. So poverty programs, need, we just need to look at the person holistically. People are messy. My mom and us were messy. We cannot solve these issues if we don't look at things squarely as they are. People are never gonna be the perfect people we want them to be, and we should design a system robust enough to help people out of that space. Finally, I would also say, 10 years before I was born, we sent a person to the moon. 10 years. We didn't outsource it. We as a people sent a person to the moon with no computers. T what happened to that spirit? Where did it go? Why did we stop believing and we had the space to do big things together? I think we need a revolution to remember that together we can truly do anything as a people. I believe the true nature of Americans comes out after a disaster. You see it, that is right there. And we need to remind ourselves that we can do things together to achieve big change. We must, it's not gonna happen with bake sales. We need institutional approaches to this. And the only game in town to do that is the government. I can't tell you how many times I hear jokes made about people in office. I always stop people, I'm like, when did you last go to a public meeting? <laughs> you think voting once a couple years makes you an active citizen or will preserve this as a democracy? I think we could do better. And it starts with us individually working together. 
so no, I don't think we're still designing systems to help truly people out of poverty. Mm -hmm. Um, well, I definitely agree with you wholeheartedly in the power of uh, the government and the power of public yeah. policy. Um, well, I was really, you know, really blown away by your book. As I've shared with you, I've read many of these. Um, I consider this the best, if not among the very best. And um, there's a part in the book where after a very difficult episode of severe abuse, you are thrown downstairs, um, you walk out of your house, and something breaks. You decide that this is the last time um, that you feel like your life is at risk. You walk to the officials and you say, I'm done. And I think your exact quote is, uh, my life matters. How did you come to that realization? What was that moment about? If you could just share that with us. So we had gone through, at that point, 12 years of homelessness in and out of shelters, and we were put into an apartment with a, a woman who was receiving no mental health treatment. Mm -hmm. And the shelter, after a while, diminishes. At first, they set you up with food every month, and, they, and then slowly they disappear. And so very quickly, my mom devolved and destabilized. And the job they gave her, by the way, which is kind of funny, is they set her up with a job selling Electrolux vacuums door to door. This is an obese, mentally ill woman who can't stop smoking. And this is the job they got her. So my mom destabilized, and she became incredibly violent, more than normal, uh, and for a number of reasons. But the violence got to the point, and I also reached an age at about 12, 11, 12, where cognitively something occurred, which is you start to understand things a little differently. And so we sent my brother, we, we helped my brother run away, and my sister was next, and I was going to follow. And it, after my brother ran away, everything else fell apart. And my mom unleashed uh, a wave of violence that was we had not experienced with her. And so after that violent moment, when I was at the bottom of the stairs, my Tasmanian devil t-shirt, um, I walked out. And I was pretty much naked. And I walked into a traffic court. I didn't know. It looked like a court building. So I walked into the court building barefoot and bleeding. And I walked in and collapsed. And that sent me into the foster care system ultimately. Um, mm -hmm. That 1.4 miles. Is what you walked. Wow. I went back. Mm -hmm. So that set me up on a different pathway. Mm -hmm. But ultimately your brother and sister also entered foster care. Yeah. So my brother and sister, uh, my brother was... My brother self-identified. He, he had gotten to New York, back to where we're from, living with our, one of our neighbors who was a very lovely prostitute. Um, and she eventually told him, Alex, you got to like, you got to call, you got to go home. Mm -hmm. um, she was great. Uh, they got put into a uh, traditional foster care home placement together. Mm -hmm. Well, let's talk a little bit about, you know, staying with your mother um, you know, the, in your book, you discuss her mental illness and how systematic failures to treat her impacted you and your siblings. But what do you think people don't understand about living with a parent with serious mental illness? No matter what your mother does to you, maybe some of you have mothers. It's your mother. And young kids growing up, most foster kids go home either during foster care. Foster care is a system designed to reunite families. It's not an adoption slippery and slide. Most foster kids go home, even after they emancipate from foster care, which by the way, the word is emancipation. We should language. Mm -hmm. um, so what we have to do is if we want the kid to tru truly be healthy, we're ignoring the family and they're gonna go home to that family. So I think if we want success out of this generation, we have to make sure the parents are set up for success, the bio parents. And for my mom, she was never going to get custody over us again. But she's still a human being that should have had, should, she deserved better than what society gave her. I walked in San Francisco over the last um, uh, day that I've been here, and I see so many people like my mom. And I had to essentially sue the state to get custody of my mother. And after, after that, getting her off the street and getting her he healthy, she's been stable for 25 years because she has a lawyer for a son who's very grumpy and persistent. Every person on the street deserves an advocate like that. And we don't have that. 
Well, that is very related to my next question, which is about, you know, the conversation currently about whether judges should have the power to compel treatment. We know in California we have the care court. Mm -hmm. New York is discussing or, and potentially I think even already implemented something similar. Yeah. Kind of based on your experience with your mother and your life, what is your point of view on that? I couldn't be more supportive. I want to hug Gavin Newsom, not just for gay marriage. Thank you, <laughs> Mayor, Governor. Um, but for care court, mm -hmm. government is iteration. It's never done. So there are things I'd like to see fixed. It's never done. And this is such an important step. We fetishize the right of people without the faculties to have civil rights fully uh, self-determined. And they devolve on the streets in front of us. I don't understand that. I've lived it. And I had to fight to take my mom off the street. I had to fight the state. I think care court is an awesome innovation and revelation, and I thank the governor for it, and I hope we continue to refine it. There's already things that have come out that we need to work on, but I believe California can do it right. I truly believe it. This is not Nurse Ratchet and One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. It ain't happening. We gotta do better by people like my mom, and I think we can. I think care court is this massive leap forward. Mm -hmm. That's great to hear. I think we also share a lot of those opinions. Um, I know there's a lot of concerns about individual rights, but um, why not try? Yeah. Um, well, the next question I want to talk to you about is this distinction we often draw between youth in foster care and homeless youth. We pretend these are different people. Mm. Um, and your lived experience shows that that is a distinction without a difference. Um, in California, we have a tremendously robust system if you're in the care and custody of a foster care system. However, if you, if, if you aren't, if the system hasn't identified you because you've run away, trying to keep yourself yeah. safe, you almost get nothing. Um, and so I'm wondering how you think the system should work between these two groups and what role, if any, you think our child welfare system has in, in bridging that approach uh, instead of having oh. it be in silos. It's not even in silos. Yeah. There's a silo for foster care. There's really almost nothing until very recently for yeah. homeless youth. I, I don't know if you know this, but I feel like I should be interviewing Amy. This is like one of the <laughs> foremost experts in the state of California um, on these issues. So thank you for doing this. Uh, when I was about four-ish, we lived under Grand Central which was quite an experience. And we were not the only families. Um, and I remember very distinctly, uh, we would spread out in the morning and I took Metro North. If you're familiar with the Grand Central, Metro North serves Westchester County and up. And we begged in the morning. Do you know why we begged in the morning? People had not yet had a bad day. Mm -hmm. Begging in the morning, you may notice it here, I don't know. You're more successful in the morning. People are grumpy at the end of the day. And so I was out there in the morning one, one morning and I was all geared up and what people gave me would determine my, do I eat? Does my mom have cigarettes? It's everything. And I remember this day in particular because I think you reach these different cognitive states. And I reached an age where I suddenly had burnt memories in my mind. And do you know that Peanuts character with a cloud of mm. Michigas all around him? Um, what's his name? Pigpen. Pig pen. Um, that's what I was. So here I was begging on that platform, and up ahead of me, about four feet, everyone separated without even looking at me, and then came back behind me. And I remember so distinctly being like, they don't see me. Like, I am mm. invisible. But I'm here, but I'm invisible. I, I, I could not, it was such a cognitive dissonance. And I remember thinking, why don't they see me? And then I thought, oh God, I have homeless people. I had uncontrolled sores all over my body, including all over my face. I smelt, I was filthy. Of course they didn't want to be near me. And I realized, I'm like, oh my God, I'm, I'm disgusting. And I, they, I'm invisible. If my family disappeared, no one would care. That kid is the same kid that went into foster care. You don't mm -hmm. leave any of these experiences behind you. And what's so interesting to me is we try and categorize children. They're just children. And no child is disposable. No child is disposable. Homeless, foster, kids that are kept in their homes with support, children. I've never understood how we, we segment children out and decide who gets to live or die or who gets which resource. They're children. I said something the other day that I almost got shot in the face for. I, we were talking about education. I was in LA uh, at a forum speaking and 
we were talking about public schools and a gentleman stood up and he said, don't you want every foster kid to be able to go to Montessori? And I said, no. I said, I'd prefer we ban all private schools. Watch how quickly the public schools get fixed. And do I think we should ban private schools? No, but if we don't think differently about children as a group, we're never gonna reach our full moral potential. And kids are suffering for no good reason. There is no reason that the children you talk about should have different services. And I think California should lead the way. I think we're getting there. Mm -hmm. I wish we get there faster. Mm -hmm. um, but what did, what did Dr. King say? The arc of justice is long, but it bends towards justice. And with advocates and, and people with lived experience, screaming, yelling, and organizing, CYC, California Youth Connection, uh, I think we're making the change. Yeah, I do. I definitely think in the last several years, we are recognizing, I think the homeless crisis has gotten so serious that yeah. there's like, well, maybe if we actually address this earlier, we can prevent chronic homelessness. Yeah. I'm like, well, whatever it takes. <laughs> yeah. um, well, one thing I want to talk to you about definitely is education. Uh, because it's clear from the book you missed big stretches of school. Um, you didn't have adults at many stages of your life really emphasizing school or really supporting your education. And yet it comes out in the book that you have just a bright commitment to that. Um, you see yourself in higher education. You see yourself succeeding in education. And I'm wondering if you could tell us how you could see that given the circumstances you're experiencing. Um, I think mm. particularly young people who are in foster care in the audience would be interested in hearing that. Yeah. I was lucky to have my mom. Um, my mom was an educated woman with a progressive mental illness that eventually overwhelmed her. And she, uh, despite everything, would constantly tell me I was going to Harvard. And I was like, how about I go through kindergarten? It'd be nice <laughs> to go to school. You know, like, can we start there? Uh, <laughs> I'd like to learn to read. Uh, let me tell you a funny side story. I'll answer your question about education. So there was this program, Fresh Air Fund, the New York Times does. And so they take kids out of the shelter system. And, it, and this is back in the early 80s. And they put them on a bus. And they give them outdoor experiences. So I'm like, does it come with lunch? And so they put us on the bus. It's a Greyhound bus. And we go out to the Adirondack Mountains and they drop us off in a petting zoo. I'm like, I have no idea what the hell they're talking about, but they gave me a bag of breadcrumbs, which I shoved in my pockets because who knows where the next meal is coming from. And I was like, these idiots, they think I'm gonna give this to animals. <laughs> so I had no idea what the hell a petting zoo was. So they put me into this area, all these kids, like we're just an island of poor ass children standing there like, what the hell is this? Then they let the animals out. I start screaming <laughs> because I had never read a book. Like, I was like, imagine if like a, a cockroach with a whale tail and Donald Trump's head pops down. I was like, oh my God. And then they come over and they start nibbling my pockets. I thought they were trying to eat me. They wanted their breadcrubs. I lost my shit. Um, I was so clueless. I didn't go to school. There was no A for apple. Mm -hmm. I had seen a rat and a cat and a dog, um, but my mom, from the moment of my memory, you're gonna be a Supreme Court Justice. She wow. would say that to me. And my brother and sister, she would say, Jessica, you get the moon. We slept underneath it. Alex, you get the stars. David, the sun. Hmm. And she would say these things constantly through everything. And I think that inculcated a value in us. It lit a spark that I had to protect with my own decisions every single day. You have to make the decision that you don't want all of this immediate satisfaction, drugs, running with groups. I ran with gangs. Like you have to make the decision every day whether or not you wanna move this narrow path forward. There are very limited ways out of poverty. It should be this way. Education was the only way. And I knew it, my mom told me it, and she, she reinforced it. And then at foster care, it was incredibly challenging to keep that alive. I, I was constantly told I would never go to college. Mm. Um, and I'm, I'm like, well, we'll see. And here I am. And here you are. Um, well, that is great. Uh, well, let's talk a little bit about your siblings for a little bit, Jessica and Alex. Ah. I mean, they were um, in the book, certainly, and they, how much they mean to you was very evident. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, so tell us a little bit about them then and now, and maybe just share with us what, you know, California's passed a lot of laws to yeah. try and keep siblings together. I think some don't really understand what a important relationship that is for, for all of us, but particularly for young people who remember from yeah. the custody of their parents. But if you could share a little bit about that, we'd appreciate it. Absolutely. 
you know, growing up the way we did, and even similar experiences of other kids that may not have been homeless, but in, in uh, t- tough homes, it's, it is the constant low hum of expectation of something bad happening. Constant. It's not a matter of if, it's when. And then you have to be ready to recover from it quickly. And I don't mean bruises healing. I mean, you've got to be ready because then something else could come. And it is this constant hum of fear of violence or something like that that perpetuates your life. And it is almost like white noise to you. But it even affects me today. Like I, have a, I was in a restaurant earlier today and the person I'm sitting down to have a coffee with sat down with their back against the wall and my chair was facing the room. You never did that at Juby Hall. Never. Especially as a gay kid. Um, and I got a little anxious, I have to tell you. Like, I got a little anxious. I'm like, oh my God, I'm, I'm exposed. I'm like, David, the coffee here is $18. <laughs> like, you're going to be fine. Uh, you know, they did have a deal on oysters, but the, you know, that was it. So the only consistent thing that helped me with that low level was my brother and sister. The only consistent thing in my life that wasn't hurting me, <laughs> other than playful violence, was my brother and sister. And they were ripped out of my life. And I remember very distinctly, there was this one time when I started my advocacy work, I talk about it. I was pulled out of, a, I was in a delinquent, I was in a, it was, technically it was a kid jail, it was a youth prison um, for the crime of being gay. Still gay. <laughs> You're shocked. Um, <laughs> and they put us in a room and they wanted a state senator who had come. He was on a photo tour, if you ask me. And he had just come out as a former foster youth and he wanted to talk to foster youth. There was a listening tour. And then he proceeded in this hour long meeting to talk for 45 minutes. So I was the second person to his right. I had just been removed from a facility that was horrible. And it came to me and I said, are you for real? And he looked at me, his staff was like all, and he's like, what? I'm like, this is an hour long listening session and you just talked for 45 minutes. There are 14 kids in this room. Do you want to hear us or did you just want to keep going? And he was like, oh my God. And then to his credit, he said, you're right. And he stayed. He, he said, buy pizza. Mm-hmm. He bought pizza and we stayed. And it's the first time I saw my siblings in years across the room. They were in this room too. And it was the first time I got to see them. The loss of them was so profound. Um, and I didn't lose them once. It was like mm-hmm. again and again, I would lose them. Uh, when they had them for a moment, I would lose them. So it, it is something we must focus on, but we need more homes that'll take in sibling sets. Mm-hmm. I definitely got the sense in the book, they were just always kind of at your fingertips and they were together yeah. and you weren't with them. And that also sounded very, very hard. Um, well, on the kind of topic of uh, more foster care placements, Um, You know, California, along with many other states, is uh, trying to, you know, encourage more relatives uh, to be foster care parents. And you also, at the conclusion of your book, say we need more foster parents and we need more college educated foster parents so that uh, young people can get the motivation and see that college is possible. Um, What are some of the barriers that you think are preventing more people from stepping into this space and, and playing that role? Yeah, I think it's important to distinguish. I want to distinguish. I do not condemn the many foster parents that I had that were terrible. I do not condemn them because at least they opened their home. Mm -hmm. The worst thing than their violence on me is the apathy of all of us that do nothing except complain and once in a while read a story in the paper. That is the problem. I think we need more foster parents, period. I say that with gratitude to people who are doing it now. It's not about displacing anybody. It's very important because people that do it now are disproportionately poor and people of color. And so we have to be very thoughtful when I talk about this, that it's about adding more people Mm -hmm. with gratitude to people and communities that do it disproportionately now. The reason I say we need more middle-class people is kind of how I focus on it is for two reasons. One, close your eyes. Where would you want your kid? If they had to go into foster care, what does that home look like? That's what we should have for foster kids. Two, they have political power. I remember people in Los Angeles of power got foster kids and all of a sudden, you know, conversations could happen differently. Three, what are the barriers you asked? Very simple. Most people think they're middle class. They're actually not. But if you look at middle class, what are the issues they're concerned about? Why don't they spend the resources to do this? 
They're worried about retirement. They're worried about college for their kids. They're worried about health care. What if we made them county employees? What if they got a pension after 10 years? What if their kids went to free school, state, and co uh, state colleges and universities? All of a sudden, we'd get the thousands of parents we need from across the country. And I, I also talk about social workers. Mm -hmm. I remember so distinctly, I once asked my sister, who's a social worker in LA, Jessica, what do you do for a living? You know what she told me? Paperwork. She's a licensed therapeutic social worker with 15 years of experience. And the only time we as the public pay attention is when one of them messes up and then we layer in more paperwork as if that's the solution. My sister could not afford to buy a home within 30 miles of where she worked. Wow. Master's degree from a very good school, not UCLA, USA. <laughs> what if my sister got an interest-free home loan after five years? We would stop churning through social workers. What if we treated them with respect and dignity as opposed to heckle them and come at them when one of them messes up? I think there's the players in the system could be lifted up and engaged in a different way. So I talk about that. The afterward mm -hmm. is a love letter to America yep. to do something. No, and that's one reason why I really appreciated the book. There's a lot of truth, like, you know, the, your experience, but you really point to a lot of uh, things we can do. Yeah. But we have to be bold and we have to be willing to kind of put our money where our mouth is. And it really isn't always um, right now. But you, one thing you mentioned when you said you were in juvenile hall was, you know, the effect of your sexuality on your foster care experience. That was a major theme in this book and how you suffered mightily uh, because of it. Um, I consider myself someone who thought I would have understood that, but you made me understand even more the level of pain that was there it, to be in a system that not only did not accept it or embrace it, but actually put you in a place where you were not safe. Um, so if you tell us just a little bit about that experience. There better be tequila at this after party. <laughs> um, I have a friend here. Um, so when I went into foster care, I was immediately diagnosed as what they called then gender identification disorder, which is mm -hmm. a legitimate diagnosis to help people that have uh, gender dysmorphia, transgender issues. It was applied to, to foster kids that were gay or lesbian or, or non-conforming, and treatment was then ruled out. And the other issue was, and to be a foster home, you're basically rated one through 10. Can you take a kid that's a 10? A 10 might be behavioral issues, a disability, whatever it is, it's a more complicated, hard case. As a kid with GID, I was immediately a 10, which meant there were no foster homes that would take, could take me. And so I was put into the penal system and treated. And the violence started immediately um, with staff and, and other youth in the facility. I didn't belong there. And my social worker, I remember so distinctly, she was driving me. I was still happy to be in foster care. <laughs> Lasted two days. <laughs> she drove me. And I remember driving and she paused after we went through the first fence with barbed wire. And she pulled over and, I, and then there was another one up ahead and I, I was like, why is there barbed wire? She leaned over and we're friends on Facebook today. And she said, you don't belong here. I will get you out. She didn't. Mm -hmm. And I went through a number of those placements before I ultimately came out into normal foster care. And it was absolutely brutal, which is why it's funny. Like there's a lot of drama in our lives, right? Work, love. I'm always very cathartic because I've been through different experiences. I'm like, oh, if only you knew. Foster care was brutal. But what I'm grateful for is that experience. I'll tell you why. I have, I've many times negotiated with God in the shower about winning the lottery. I think we all have. I'll give half the charity, two thirds. <laughs> How much do you want from me? And I remember when I started realizing I was gay, I ranted at God. I was like, are you fucking kidding me? On top of everything else, you're giving me this cherry too. When I grew up in New York City, it was the peak HIV AIDS epidemic. The shelters had segregated areas for people dying of what we didn't know exactly. And we saw them on the streets in the same places we lived. The lesson was very clear about what we thought of homosexuals. Mm -hmm. And then my mom was homophobic and then I went into the system that was brutal. And I was so angry at God and the universe for doing this to me. But then something changed. And in the book, I talk about it. I was in DC and I came out at different times in different spheres based on safety. And I had the chance to work with the Child Welfare League of America 
and Lambda Legal, which is a queer civil rights organization, which had come together for the first time to stop the curing of gay children in child welfare. And I remember so distinctly, they were looking for youth advocates. They couldn't find any because it was so dangerous. Mm -hmm. And I raised my hand and I was the first one and it took us 13 years, but it's no longer allowed. Mm -hmm. And I am very grateful. And I think that's how I justify all of those experiences is, can you harness this mm -hmm. and do something? Growing up queer in foster care is awful. 30% of kids in foster care today identify as queer. 30%, many of them trans. Why? Because they're not safe out there. And then they go into a system like this it's not that bad anymore, but it ain't great. We need more people, not just to tolerate, mm -hmm. but to incorporate and love these kids in their homes for who the hell they wanna be. So it was a brutal system. It was a brutal upbringing. I'm proud of what I did with that. Uh, and I hope no kid has to go through something like that again. Mm -hmm. No, it, uh, it's better, but like you said, it's far, it, it can get a lot better. Uh, I think we're, making progress, but much more to go. But I think that your advocacy um, definitely took you to a, you know, it was a powerful, it seems like a light was really turned on when you totally. began to advocate, when you began to speak up, when you met young people from other states, yeah. developed some solidarity, speaking to policymakers, sharing your story. Um, tell us a little bit about that and kind of why you think young people continue need to be, to be the voice of the change we need to see. So one of my big breaks came right after I insulted the state lawmaker. So one of his staff people went to work in DC, they don't remember all the connections, and I was pulled out of my detention facility and they said, I swear to you, you sound white. <laughs> I was like, okay, we're gonna send you to DC. And I was like, great, a vacation. And we're gonna have you talk to legislators. I was like, okay. They then put me through rigorous media training and helped me understand what I was there to talk about, which was the Chafee Independence Act, which is really a law that for the first time helped foster kids transition out of foster care. And I went to work on the Hill. I went to meet with these senators. You may remember Larry Craig. <laughs> Spent time with Larry. Um, Tom DeLay, mm -hmm. uh, all of these uh, Dixiecrats or, or Republicans. I was the wh whisperer. And <laughs> they weren't Michelle Bachman. They weren't, we would talk. And they were like, they were very open to this issue. I think this issue is nonpartisan. And I got the taste for it that I could use my story not as a car accident on the side of the road, mm -hmm. but to inspire and motivate people to realize that we need them. We need them. We need them to get over the politics. We need them to focus on these children. And I was able to do that and that with, with a group of kids. We founded the first national organization for foster youth to have a voice which is now spread all over and uh, it was successful and I kept coming back to different ways to do that, including the extension of foster care to 21. I advocated to 30, but no one listened to me. Um, it's now 21 in the state of California. I advocated for 30, because who's independent at 29? Um, and I continue to be involved in child welfare reform, listening to the voice, not just of kids, but like any law about any people is gonna be better if those mm -hmm. people are helping write it, if not writing it. So I'm a firm believer in that. I also realize that I am m very old. And so listening to youth voice is not necessarily David's voice. Mm -hmm. uh, we need to constantly make sure that we're refreshing with new talent, new people, and, and making sure they have the training and support to use their expertise to inform our system. And we're doing that. California in particular, California Youth Connection, Foster Club, there's so many great organizations doing this that I support. Um, so I think we're blessed in this state, but we have to share that elsewhere because it ain't the same everywhere. Mm -hmm. No, it definitely isn't. As someone whose full-time job is almost criticizing our foster care system, when I look far afield and compare it with other states, we, we do a lot of things right as kind of better yeah. as we could do. Um, well, I'm very interested in, uh, in, you mentioned foster care till 21. It's been a decade. We've uh, extended foster care from 18 to 21. And right now there are calls to increase to age 24 or even age 26. Um, and 
52% of individuals uh, 18 to 30 are now adult children living with their parents in the United States of America. Mm -hmm. And that's a number that has, it's not, a, it's not a pandemic related, it's yeah. slowly ticked up. So it is normative for young adults up to age 30 to get that Absolutely. extensive support. But I'm wondering, do you think we should raise it and what's the right way to do it? Because some yeah. say this court jurisdiction and social workers is just too much. What would you, you know, if you had your magic wand and you uh, had, a, had a go at it, what would you do? I get asked this by uh, the press. I get asked this by legislators. And I'm going to completely not answer your question. What I ask people to do, will you guys do it with me? Oh. Yes. You, it doesn't hurt much. Um, close your eyes. Picture your favorite animal or your child or yourself. And picture yourself putting them into foster care. Picture them at 21. Picture them at 22. Have you pulled the carpet out from underneath them? You can open your eyes. It's the wrong conversation. We need to be focused on our goal, which is how do we help young people coming out of a system and a culture of poverty and violence that is intergenerational, achieve all they can. We need to develop a system accordingly. Does it look like X or Y? I don't know. Mm -hmm. I think it needs to constantly iterate and be evolved based on the lived experience and success and data of what we find. I'm advocating right now for building a dorm at LA City College or here at San Francisco. Why? A foster dorm. We own the land, you don't have to build parking, and you have an integrated system for vocational two-year or transfer education. What if we emancipated kids into a community college? 1,200 kids in California emancipate every year into homelessness, including right here in San Francisco. Are we okay with that? One building in this city ends that pipeline. Four in the state end the pipeline. Why don't we build it? So that question, I totally I understand mm -hmm. it, but I push back only because there's never one answer. Mm -hmm. We need to be okay with complexity and constantly evolving whatever that policy is. The moment you say that is the moment it's not right. I want us to constantly be reminded that these are our children and we have to do whatever it takes. Like you would, when I close your eyes, you would not hold back if it was your child. They are your children. Mm -hmm. We have decided the government should take them. That is on us. And we're doing a job of making sure they get out of there healthy. And we, we're not okay with that. I know you're not. I'm not. So that's my answer to that question. Yeah, that's a great answer. Well, thank you. Well, we have some questions from the audience. Thank you very much for submitting these. Um, the first one is, someone's interested in where was your father? Oh, interesting. Well, there's actually a great podcast called Paternal, which I did. I remember they reached out to me and it's a podcast about fatherhood and it was about my memoir. And I'm like, did you read it? <laughs> <laughs> and he's like, that's exactly why I want to talk to you. Um, poverty is women's work. Mm -hmm. We have a sexist society. Women take care of the children. Women are poor. Poverty is women's work. I had a father. It was called an absence and it was called women taught me how to be a man. Women, who kept the lights on, women who did everything they could to take care of their kids, even imperfectly as mine own. That's who my father was. My father was my mother. And beyond that, it was Uncle Sam. I always joke, like amongst young people, I say, uh, you know, my uncle's my father, ha ha. <laughs> I say that in all truthness. I am here because I was fed by Uncle Sam, by all of you paying your taxes, pay your taxes. <laughs> I am here because of an imperfect government doing imperfect work. I'm fine with that, let's make it better. But to answer your very good question, I don't know. David is not my name, neither is Ambrose. M my name was converted to be somebody else's name so that I would have a paternal identity who's not my father. I don't know who my father is. I was born nine months to the day of Valentine's Day. That I do know, <laughs> nine months later. I have no idea. I sometimes think about it, but I also choose not to. And I'm okay with that. Father. What is a father? I don't know. I had father figures like my mom. I also had a really terrific, one terrific foster father who was a very funny man. I talked to him on the way over here today. Um, good man. So I don't know who my father is. I had very few father figures, but that's okay because I had one hell of a mother. That's great. Um, in the beginning of your talk, you started by, in your, the prologue is, uh, you referenced forgiving your mother. Why did you choose to begin your book like that? Oof. 
why did I choose to open the book with a dedication to my mom? Good question, whoever asked that. Um, my mom is, my mom created me, <laughs> right? Very simple. Um, my mom created me and I'm here today because of her, her imperfect shepherding of us as children. Um, and it's, she's truly the hardest thing in my life. You know, I've been responsible for her for 25 years and it's hard. And if my mom had breast cancer, we would rally around her. But mental health in this country is shameful. So many people suffer at different levels for different things, people around us, and we don't talk about it. It's shameful. And if my mom had cancer, we'd have a color, a ribbon, and a walk. But we don't. My mom is a prisoner in a place where she has not been out of for 80 years of fear, constant fear. She believes this stuff. And I look at this woman, even with everything that happened, and how could you not have a little bit of empathy and think, my God, if I was never let out of prison? She believes this stuff. And so I look at her and it, forgiveness is not a one and done decision, right? Mm -hmm. Like we're all, we've been in relationships. It's like a tennis match back and forth, right? You give it, you deserve it, you owe it. Every day I have to choose to forgive her. What an important lesson to have taught me because walk around this world. Mm -hmm. I sometimes look at my early life and I think if I had all the anger at all of the people, I would never have survived. My mom taught me to forgive very young. I had to do it because I had to be with her and then I had to do it in a system to get through every day and then I had to do it today. But my mom taught me how to exercise that muscle to truly look at a woman and a human being in such profound distress and see past what was happening to her core. That is hard. And I am grateful for that lesson because it has served me so well in my life. Absolutely. The next one is a question. Someone wants to know, what was that Latin quote at the beginning? Oh, I thought you were going to ask who I'm wearing. No. <laughs> Hashtag Sandro. I'm looking to get an endorsement deal <laughs> or just a discount. <laughs> it's expensive. Um, Illegitimi non cabarundum. So in my first placement, um, I was, my first uh, 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 detention placement, it was tough. Like it was really quite a jarring experience. And I was being consistently put in what they called isolation. And that was because I was not a good victim. I learned how to fight my entire life and I did not I did not take it, <laughs> um, and that was not well received. So I was being isolated one time in this room with no furniture, but it had built-ins, and it had a few tattered books. And I remember I loved to read, and I'm like, I'm sure these books have never been picked up before. <laughs> so I went over, and there was remnants of a book, and I started reading it. It was The Handmaid's Tale. Mm. And I thought, oh my God, it's my biography. <laughs> And if you remember, Offer was in that room where she was being punished for not being a good victim. And I thought, holy cow, there's a manual, thanks. And I read that, and in that book is that quote. And right then and there, I was 12 years old, I thought, that is my quote. <laughs> Don't let the bastards grind you down. Don't let the bastards grind you down. Illegitimi non cabarundum. And I thought, the bastards are not people, they're systems, mm -hmm. they're, in, they're neglect, they're the benign indifference of a public. I will not be ground down by this system, this placement, these people, I will survive them. And so reading that book, years later, I finally got to read the whole thing and I'm like, it was even better with the <laughs> beginning and the end. <laughs> it was like fantastic. I have not watched the show, I can't, I can't handle it. Mm -hmm. um, I actually don't watch anything really with violence, uh, at all, I can't. So that is the quote, and it's my life motto, and it's someplace quite indiscreet on my body, uh, tattooed. All right. Uh, well, this, I didn't, I'm excited to hear you talk about this, is something I'm interested in as well. Is he, could you please talk about your experience as a foster dad? Oh, did you ever meet Vince? No. Oh. So um, my sister was a social worker in LA County, and still a social worker, and she would bring to me she supervised an office, an area, 
sort of, it's complicated, but just go with that. And she would identify in her office amongst her team, queer kids or kids that were super smart or both. <laughs> but sometimes they're both. And she would bring them to me and I called it speed mentoring. And I would sometimes just meet them for 15, 20 minutes and I would try and identify a service or a connection to a nonprofit um, that I could get them connected to because they were not gonna make it. You know, they were, they were suffocating the system. And so this kid walked into my office with bad hair, bad teeth and a bad attitude. And I fixed two of those right away. Um, and I fell in love. Um, I don't know what it was. He, uh, I think he was, he was young and so much potential. And I just looked at him like, oh my God, you're gonna go this way, you're gonna go this way. I hope you go this way. And I thought, I, I wanna know this person. And I just started getting more and more and more involved in this young man's life. And then he became my foster son. And uh, you know, he's, he's doing great. He's, he's getting his PhD in artificial intelligence. He actually worked for Amazon. Um, <laughs> I didn't say that in my interview process. Um, <laughs> and uh, he's doing great. He's uh, at Cornell, he's married, he's, he's very successful That's and happy. Wonderful. He's got three brothers that I am uh, lightly involved with and they're wonderful, they're doing great too. I never intended to do that. Um, but to my own call to action, right? We keep looking around for who's gonna help these kids. <laughs> and this was the universe kind of laughing at me going, ha ha ha, you. Mm -hmm. And he was the most important thing I ever done. When I was about 37, my world fell apart. And he was one of the reasons why. When I was young, it was just constant crap coming at you, like just constant stuff. And I remember this developing this visual image where I would take the thing and I'd put it in a clear plastic bin and label it. I was gay. And I put it and I organized it and it was on the shelf, alphabetized. It's all in my head. Because you needed to know it, but you didn't have to feel it. You needed to learn from it, but you didn't have to feel it, no matter what was being done to you. And I remember when I was about 37, my son demanded that I be vulnerable. He wanted to understand my past. He wanted to know that it was okay for him to mourn his childhood. And I never, ever cried from 12 to 37, not once. And my son demanded vulnerability from me. And it broke me. And it broke my shelf. And not only did I lose my coping mechanism, all of that came off the damn shelf. And I wrote a book about it. Mm -hmm. And I credit my son for giving me endless love and the most important lesson of my life, other than my mother, um, on how to be a true feeling human uh, man. So he's doing great. I talk to him all the time. He's wonderful. Alex and Jessica are doing great too. I failed to answer that question. Mm -hmm. Both are happy, healthy, with great families. Everyone's great. Well, this is great. Um, I think there's one last question that I want to ask you um, as we head towards the sure. end of the program. And I know that you have brought this mission, you have the book, but you're also doing so many different things personally and professionally to bring awareness to the issue, to change the system. Would you tell us about some of those? Yeah. So first my day job, I actually, I work at Amazon um, and I literally get paid to do good in the world is how I think of it. How do we show up in communities in my region, which is Southern California and contribute to those communities using all the resources Amazon has and really listen to those communities. And so I brought my own particular flavor to that, which is really what they allow. And I have centered poverty and youth to the extent I can in our programs and our thinking. We just kicked off a hunger program. If you remember the first line of the book, it's I'm hungry. Hunger is such an intimate thing to me. And I constantly think about it. And I'm now able to run a rather large with partners uh, program. So I feel very lucky to find this career in this company. Um, and then I have a lot of side projects, <laughs> as you might imagine. Um, I'm working on the dorm, which I mentioned. I also co-founded a nonprofit, which is called Fostermore. It's a great campaign right now. It's an effort to rebrand foster care. So after media, being in media for 15 years, I realized one of our biggest problems in the child welfare industrial complex is we talk to ourselves. If you think about breast cancer, you think of Pink, The Cure, and Susan G. Komen. What do you all think about foster care? Kind of a mess. What if you thought about education and hope? How do we get from there to there? No matter what the nonprofits do in building and weaving the biggest sail humanly possible, if there is no wind, you're not going anywhere. And the wind is the consciousness and caring of the American public. We need that wind. We have to talk to the public, not down to, not past, 
Stop using funny language. Stop renaming things mm -hmm. and speak to the public. That is how we're going to achieve real change is engaging the good nature of the public. Foster Moore is now a 12 year of effort. We have worked with Grey's Anatomy and Doc McStuffins. We have PSAs on every platform. I'm still working on Amazon, but I'm confident I'll get there. Um, streaming our PSAs. And right now, I'll end with this. We have a campaign called Donate Your Small Talk. Have you ever started a Zoom or got an elevator and you're like, how are the kids? What are you doing this weekend? You know, blah, blah, blah. No one cares, actually. No one cares. It's verbal diarrhea. It's verbal diarrhea. It's nice to tease. It's socially awkward. What if all of us talked about children? What if all of America, doesn't have to be sad. Did you know John Lennon was a foster kid? True. Nelson Mandela, Maya Angelou, Cher, Eddie Murphy, John Lennon, who else? Steve Jobs. I'm in the Valley, sort of. I'm where they live. So <laughs> what if we talked about that? That's my fun fact. What if all of us talked about something we care about children? Instead of talking about salads, mm -hmm. what if we talked about children? So I want you to donate your small talk, not just in May for Foster Care Awareness Month, every year, all year, every day, every time you have an awkward moment. And it can be awkward. I do it all the time. It's a little awkward. I don't really care. <laughs> Let's do it. So uh, I know this is the end. I want to thank you for doing this for me and with me. And I am honored. This is one of the best thinking people in child welfare reform in the country. This is why I asked. I'm grateful. I also want to thank Amazon and Sally Kay for supporting me in this work. It is incredible to have this job, but it's even better to have colleagues that support you no matter what they do. And I'm very grateful for that. And I have a lot of friends here. I'm not going to call you all out, but thank you for supporting me. And yes, you can each buy five copies of the book. I will be watching outside and signing. So thank you very much, everybody. Well, before we break, I want to thank you and so much for writing this book. It's spectacular telling your story and uh, we just appreciate it very, very much, David. And uh, I'm Amy Lemley with John Burton Advocates for Youth and this is a Commonwealth Club program is now adjourned. Please join us outside for the room for reception. Yay!